looking now at Britain um, and seeing the new destinations that she is planning to go to and looking at Brexit itself and the wonderful way the angels have been working in the past uh, year or so. So, Brexit Britain charts new destinations, working with her young lions. So we read together from Isaiah chapter 23. Uh, we'll just open it in. We recognise this is a chapter that deals with the city of Tyre, which was the main uh, mercantile power in the time of the Z prophet Eze uh, Isaiah, uh, and in the time of Ezekiel too. Uh, Tyre was to the north of Israel, uh, a thriving port. Nations came from all around the world to the markets there to exchange goods. But Isaiah was seeing here the ending of Tyre as the city to the north of Israel. And uh, we're not going to look at the history of it, but Nebuchadnezzar came and uh, besieged it and caused them to move over to the little island offshore. And then several hundred years later, Alexander the Great comes along, um, builds that causeway out to the city, uh, and Tyre, uh, as it was known then, came to an end. But the interesting thing is that in this prophecy, we read in verse um, 5, no, verse 7, um, her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. So that, that's giving us an indication that the power of time might disappear from its location where it had always been to a new location which is afar off. And again, it is a fascinating study and not part of our talk this morning to trace how the maritime power moves steadily westward until in Elizabethan times it arrives at the shores of Britain. And Britain carries out the mantle of a maritime power with its ships, doing trade around the world, bringing goods to and fro, importing, exporting. And we believe that uh, Britain is the latter-day Tyre uh, power. Because it is quite evident, as we read through that chapter, that there is a future Tyre that will be working to help the Lord Jesus when he comes back in helping bring back the Jews and building uh, Israel from the ruins that it has been left by the Gogan forces. So it is clear from Isaiah and other passages that there is to be a latter-day Tarshish power, uh, and we believe that Britain fulfills that role. Now, there's an interesting uh, aspect to this, is that Tyre was to be forgotten for 70 years, prior to this time when she will be working with the Lord Jesus. I mean, it doesn't say the Lord Jesus, but when we're working for Yahweh. So she to be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king, and after the end of 70 years, Tyre's going to sing as an harlot. Take in heart, go about the city, thou harlot that has been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs, that thou mayest be remembered. And it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that Yahweh will visit Tyre and she shall turn to her hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And then we have this concluding verse. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. It shall not be treasured nor laid up for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before Yahweh to eat sufficiently, and for durable clothing. So in some sense, in this revival of Tyre, after a period of 70 years, um, the, the, she acts as an harlot, trading power, uh, and then that power is going to be used in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that we are in this period of the ending of the 70 years. It's difficult to know just when to start dating, and obviously hindsight gives us a clue. But 
Really, Britain was very battered and bruised and broken at the end of World War II. She had expended every effort to smash Hitler. Uh, the Americans had come in with their assistance for very late on in the war. I uh, were very grateful for the Commonwealth countries for all the help that they had given. But as a country, Britain was on her knees at the end of World War II. Uh, and that ended on the 2nd of September 1945. And if we take that as a start date, then the Brexit vote last year was exactly 70 years and nine months uh, later. And here is Britain saying, uh, I no longer want to be confined to the EU. She joined the EU because she felt she had to, she was so weak that she needed to be part of a bigger groupage. Uh, but she found that that was a big mistake and over the years has built her strength up and now decides she wants to be a worldwide trading power as she always had been. Uh, and so I think this is a remarkable uh, prophecy that 70 years Britain, Tyre, uh, would be in a bad state but then under the care of God that would change and now she is prepared to go to the ends of the earth to do her trade. And so for 44 years, Britain has been a member of this ever-growing group. There were only 12 members when Britain joined the EU. But uh, as I say, she found that this club that she had joined, she liked <coughs> playing, let's say, tennis. So she had joined a tennis club. And then she found that the fees kept on going up and up and up. And this club was no longer interested in playing tennis, she wanted to play golf. And that's what she hadn't joined for that. And furthermore, she wasn't allowed to go and associate with uh, other tennis clubs because that wasn't in the rules and regulations. And so Britain found herself in this awkward position. She was always in opposition to what the EU wanted to do. And she couldn't do the things that she wanted to do because she was bound by all the rules and regulations. And so there was this general feeling that we ought to leave. And so David Cameron, uh, Prime Minister before Mrs May, um, made the decision that when the time was right, he would allow the British people to vote on whether they wanted to leave or not, never imagining that in totality that there would be enough votes for them to leave. Britain was very closely tied uh, to the EU, but God had uh, other thoughts and other things. And so this simple ballot uh, uh, referendum on should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union. And they put a cross against remain a member or leave the Union. Now, the 23rd of June was the day when the voting took place. And quite remarkably, there was a tremendous storm which came in from the continent and affected the southeast of England. It gave a month's rainfall to parts of London and Kent and Sussex uh, in one day. It caused uh, polling stations to be flooded. Uh, it caused transport systems to be unusable. Many houses in that region were flooded. And the odd thing was that this storm came from the direction of Europe, from Brussels. Normally in the summertime we have many storms in Britain, but they come from the Atlantic. Uh, thanks to Canada and America, you know, they come across the Atlantic and eventually uh, dump their rain upon Britain. So this was unusual. And it started almost precisely at midnight on the 23rd, the day that the voting was going to take place. And so, and it just affected uh, quite a, a narrow band of the country. Um, Angela and I were up in the near Lake District and lovely sunny day. Um, but down in the south, uh, very, very wet. Now, one needs to appreciate that this was the area where the London commuters live. And London was very much for remaining in the EU. They built up all their wealth by being members of the EU. And the 
ease of banking and all that. So in the very area that would have voted to <coughs> remain, many people didn't go to vote because they couldn't. They were bailing out their houses. Um, it, it disrupted life just for one day. And this uh, comment in the Express, summer storms almost always hit Britain from the Atlantic. The huge storms smashing the country today, this is from their website, swept in almost precisely at midnight from the direction of Brussels. Although not unheard of, it is of course very coincidental that the low pressure causing the heavy downpours over Britain today is coming in from Europe. Was it coincidental or was this the angelic hand? Well, we know what it was. So the vote was taken, and unlike uh, normal voting in Britain, the end result was the total number of votes added up for those who wanted to stay, those who wanted to remain, uh, and whichever was the highest total uh, would uh, be the, the winner. Now, Britain was divided. England and Wales, uh, majority, voted to leave, 52% uh, in both those cases. In Northern Ireland and Scotland, the majority was to remain. But because Northern Ireland and Scotland are very small populations, uh, that, that was all outweighed. So, and quite a small majority, 52% to 48% was the overall result. So it was to leave. So you can see there the population of Scotland, although it's 32% of the land mass, it's only 8% of the population. And Northern Ireland, 6% of the land mass, but only 3% of the um, voting. And you can see how it is the United Kingdom, these four nations came together uh, and worked together. And when we come to Ezekiel 38, and we have that description of the merchants of Tarshish uh, in the plural, we can see how accurate God was when he dictated these words to uh, Ezekiel. And I believe that the uh, union of the four countries will hold together through thick and thin. And so, the, as I said earlier, when the cartoonists look at the, the things from Britain's viewpoint, Britain is sailing away from the EU. Now, under the latest treaty that was drawn up, the Treaty of Lisbon, there was an Article 50, which is the last major article. There is a 51, 52, 53, but they're very minor things. But So the last part of the Treaty of Lisbon, for the first time in any treaty that the EU had made, had put in a provision that if a nation wanted to leave, then there was a procedure. They had to give formal notice that they wanted to leave. There would be a two-year slot for negotiations, uh, and then they would leave. And I think perhaps when that was put together, nobody ever thought that anybody would want to leave the EU. And so Britain triggered this Article 50, uh, and this is the first time it has been triggered. And uh, that was uh, triggered, although the vote was taken in the middle of last year, um, because uh, one's only got a two-year time slot to do all the negotiations, Britain wasn't in any hurry to actually start the clock ticking down. So it wasn't until the 29th of March that the British representative handed over the letter which Mrs May had written to the EU formally saying, we want to leave, start the clock counting down, start the negotiations so that we can leave. Now, as a result of the leave vote, David Cameron resigned that morning, and uh, after a short while, Mrs. May emerged as the leader of the Conservative Party. Now, Mrs. May had been one of those that wanted to remain, and so she had to change her outlook. The British people had voted to leave, and so she accepted that uh, and is now running with that leave board. But in her heart of hearts, she wanted to remain. And again, the cartoonists uh, get it so well. So uh, this is following delivering of the letter. Um, 
can we stay friends? And that's what she would like to do, to stay friends with the EU and just have Britain on the outside of the EU but still quite closely integrated with the EU. But I believe the angels have different plans. If you can remember the map I showed you of the division of the Roman Empire, I showed a map, uh, and Sister Angela corrected me, I showed a map which didn't show Britain as part of the Roman Empire. Because Britain was part of the Roman Empire, it was conquered, and in fact Constantine and his father came from Britain. Um, but by AD 400, uh, the Roman armies had had enough of Britain, they withdrew, and Britain thereafter was no longer part of the Roman Empire. So, just as in the past, as Britain was part of the Roman Empire, uh, and then left and went her independent way, so we have a similar situation, she's been part of the EU, and now going to break away from it. And I believe the angels have a role for Britain, which is totally outside the EU. Now, in preparation for these talks, Mrs May and the Conservative Party was doing very well in the elections, and they, she decided that she would call an election uh, in order to boost the number of seats that the Conservatives had. The polls were all in her favour, but it was all a great disaster. And in fact, instead of gaining seats, she lost seats, she lost her majority. It all backfired upon her. And again, I believe that was the angelic hand. If she had increased her majority, then she would have gone into the talks with the EU with a very strong hand and would have had the whip hand. As it is, she's very weak uh, and the party is very divided. Uh, and so the EU have the whip hand. Uh, and as I say, I believe this is the care of the angels to make sure that Britain gets pushed out so that she can go her independent way. Now, as a result of losing her majority, she had to find another party to uh, come and help the Conservatives to get votes through Parliament. And she picked the DUP, the Democratic uh, Unionist Party, which is Northern Ireland Protestant Party, which was founded by Ian Paisley, and uh, they eventually hammered out an agreement, and uh, they now support the Conservatives. And the interesting thing is that this party is very Bible-based. A couple of ideas, but they're very much against gay marriage, they're very much against abortion, they're very friendly to Israel. And I believe that, again, angelic hands, ensuring that the new course that Britain has is going to be pushed upon a certain road, and that is the road of supporting Israel. Now, Mrs May is quite happy with that because she is very friendly to Israel, but she now has uh, a Conservative Party, which are, is divided, uh, but the DUP are very strongly uh, going to be pushing for Britain and Israel to do trade together. Uh, and maybe through the DUP there will be some leavening of the godlessness of the politicians that we have in Britain today. So Brexit talks began and once a month the leaders would meet for about four days, uh, have their discussions, then go away and mull those things and come back you know, a month later for the next ones. And so we've now gone through six rounds of talks. They haven't gone very well at all. Mrs May had her ideas. But there's two aspects to it. One is, right, you're leaving the club, you have got liabilities, uh, sums of money that you have promised to pay into the budget, uh, and so we've got to agree how much the divorce is going to cost. Uh, and then the other aspect is, well, how are we going to trade? What's our relationship going to be after this divorce? Uh, and the two are really linked, because if we Britain can have a good trade deal with the EU, then she's prepared to 
pays money towards it. If there's not going to be a good deal, well, what's the point in putting money? I mean, when you leave a club, you don't normally have to pay to leave. You just leave and that's the end of it. So um, we're in this interesting situation. And Mrs. May's thought was, well, we ought to be discussing both these things in parallel. But on day one from the Brexit talks, the EU said, oh no, we're going to settle how much money you're going to pay first. When we're satisfied with that, then we'll look at trade. And we're in this interesting position. We've now come to the end of the year. They have just very reluctantly, because of some last minute scrambling, uh, agreed that Britain has probably um, satisfied them uh, the as far as the money is concerned and they're expecting to start what kind of a trade agreement is going to be made uh, in the beginning of the new year. I, my gut feeling is, and I could be totally wrong, is that probably they won't be able to get an agreement and Britain will leave without an agreement. But we shall see. The thing is that Europe does more business with Britain than Britain does with Europe. Europe, as far as Britain is concerned, is a shrinking market. The world's a much bigger market. And so it's in the EU's interest not to raise too many barriers, because if they put barriers on Britain, Britain's going to put those same, same barriers on them, and they'll find it's much more expensive to export to Britain, and that will hit their exports, so that will damage the EU. The EU's got more to lose than Britain has. Britain has a network of, company, of countries that she can deal with very rapidly and quickly. So we shall see, and I don't want to spend any more time on these, but uh, yeah, it was all a bit gloomy. But uh, British business people um, are quite confident. The problem with being a member of the EU is that when you want to make a trade agreement with America or Canada or Japan or anything like that, all 27 or 28 members have to be in agreement. Now, when you've got a France and when you've got a, a Romania and all countries with different needs and that, it's very hard to find common ground. And so you tend to get the lowest common denominator. As uh, you presume we have Dyson vacuum cleaners over here, yes. Um, you know, he says, we, we can uh, do business with any country because we'll just be negotiating an agreement one-on-one. -on -one. We won't have all these other 27 other voices saying, oh, we can't do that. So um, I must admit, British business people are very divided. But the interesting thing is that all the doom and the gloom that they said would happen over Brexit hasn't happened. Uh, we've got very low unemployment, uh, exports are up, everything is up. <coughs> Though there is a lot of uncertainty as to what is to happen, money is still flowing into Britain. It's quite uh, fascinating. Uh, and men like uh, Boris Johnson, who is very much, you know, let's leave that lot behind, the world is our oyster. Uh, he set out in September uh, his vision. He started his talk by saying, you know, we were lulled into the EU with false uh, promises. They promised us a common market and it didn't turn out like that at all. We soon found it was a different agenda. But he said, you know, Britain is the centre of the financial world uh, and uh, we, we're not dependent on Europe. Uh, and we've got our opportunity to take our destination in our own hands, and we've got great opportunities in the fields of agriculture, fisheries, and electronics to establish ourselves as a major power. And Mrs May set out her vision. She saw uh, that she needed a, a, a deep uh, and special partnership with the EU. And as I say, I don't think she's going to get it. Um, but, you see, Britain is portrayed as an harlot. A harlot doesn't care. As long as she gets paid, she doesn't care who it is that she is being a harlot to. So, you know, you can look at this from both ways. Um, but she emphasises that, that, yes, there has to be a transition time, but that's going to be strictly limited. 
um, were paying what is normally our normal contribution, Britain's normal contributions till 2020. That's the end of the current budget and then no more. Uh, and uh, she sets out a vision of the EU going their way and Britain going her way. And she chose to make that for the speech in Florence. Now, Florence uh, was a, a city that was known for her trading uh, in the time of the Renaissance. This was the cradle of capitalism, um, where greed was good, uh, as the comment there. So, yes. So, we have Britain. We depict her as an old lion. Not that Ezekiel uses that phrase, he talks about the merchants of Tarshish, but she has young lions, and so you have to be a lion in order to have young lions. So, this is from World War I, war poster. Britain as the lion is a symbol which we appreciate. Um, Britain has a lot of skills which will be very helpful to her in negotiating her way around the world. She has great diplomatic skills, unlike the Americans who are very gung-ho and uh, go in and uh, upset everybody. Britain will take time and quietly talk and that's all that. She's very good at organising. Uh, she's got a monarchy um, which appeals to the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, brilliant intelligence service. Um, and, and she very much is... Uh, gives a restraining hand when things get out, when the children, the young lioness get too rowdy, you know, calm them down. And she's got this wonderful link in the Commonwealth, around the world, uh, countries that use English as a second language, use British law, English law, instead of continental law. It, 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 if, if a business wants to set up in a Commonwealth country, it costs them 10% less than if they do it in a non-Commonwealth country because of the ease of trade, language, uh, laws and that kind of thing. And associated uh, with uh, those young lions uh, are, are the young lions who have the vigour. They are young, they're much more active than Britain, but uh, have a lot of wealth, a lot of them. Uh, military might and more this gung-ho spirit that gets things done and it's a, it's a wonderful partnership old parents and young children you know to working together uh, a wonderful combination so we have this uh, wonderful network of the Commonwealth it's a very important institution many countries want to join it, and Israel is one of those countries that wants to join the British Commonwealth. Uh, and also, London is the clear centre of maritime growth, which we shall see in a moment. So, when we come to Ezekiel chapter 38, and we have this phrase, Sheba and Dida and the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to go, have you come to take us plunder? We saw yesterday the um, Dedan and Sheba is a, a very cryptic description of these southern Arab nations who at this time are coming to the defence, uh, not a very factual defence because they can't resist this onflowing, but at least they protest at the invasion of Israel. And I say that's a remarkable turnaround, isn't it? The Arab nations protesting at Israel being besieged. And so into this region where these countries are come trading powers. They don't live in these countries, or, or this isn't their country, but they, they come along and do trade, these merchants of Tarshish and their young lives. As I say, traditionally, we've seen Britain as that merchant power. There's the map of where Tyre was in the time of Isaiah and the time of Ezekiel. And we're given this interesting link that takes us back to Britain. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 27 is an incredible chapter describing all the different nations that had market stalls in the city of Tyre, had headquarters there, trading headquarters, business headquarters in Tyre. And it tells us the kind of things that they were trading in. 
and we're told that Tarshish, she traded in the affairs of Tyre with all kinds of riches. So she was a general trader, all kinds of riches, but she had specialities of metals, silver, iron, tin, and lead. They traded in their, in their affairs. And we know where those sources of materials came from in these days, and that was Britain. It was a closely guarded secret. The Phoenician sailors would sail through the Straits of Gibraltar and up the coast to Cornwall, uh, and also Wales, where there was um, tin and lead, uh, and, and bring them back. Uh, and the, the tin especially was a very important commodity, because mix it with uh, brass, you made bronze, which was so much stronger. And like trade secrets, you know, they... The Phoenicians didn't want people to know where these things came from. They didn't want other nations to go and get their own supplies. It was a closely guarded secret. But this is from the Penguin Atlas of World History, and it marks tin and lead coming from uh, Britain there. And uh, we know that the mining of tin and lead and other things goes way, way back in Britain very ancient uh, uh, industry. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Her Majesty's Stationary Office uh, book on mining activities in England. The principal economic minerals of southwest England are, of course, tin, copper ores, considerable amounts of lead, zinc, silver, arsenic, antimony, sulfur, iron, manganese have been raised. So those highlighted are the ones that are mentioned by Ezekiel. The date of the discovery of tin in the west of England is not known, but it was being produced about 2,500 years ago. In other words, in the time of Ezekiel, you know, we know that tin was being produced. And so many shipwrecks have been found off the coast with tin ingots uh, and Phoenician objects found in Cornwall and around there. We know that this was a trade that went on. So Tarshish was trading in the fairs of Tyre. And we believe that Britain has a role, uh, as it had in the First World War, in opening up the area in order that all these little countries of the Middle East would come into being, and Israel was one of those countries that would come into being, that she still has a role in that area. That's, I'll put that map back on. You know, that's precisely the area, the blue area, where Britain is busy working behind the scenes. And Britain is a global giant. Um, she is a leading merchant power. She is the world's largest source of international bank lending, which is so important in trade. Uh, and she has the world's largest share of cross-border lending, when one country lends to another in order to do trade. Um, Britain is, that, that's where it all takes place in the uh, various uh, exchanges, Baltic exchanges, etc. in London. So the members of the Baltic exchange in London handle at some stage two-thirds of all the world's open market bulk cargo. Never seen in Britain, but in London they're organising the shipping, they're organising the insurance and uh, the movement of goods from A to B. Never comes to London but it is handled there, bought and sold in the markets, uh, in the exchanges in London. The UK has a world-class maritime centre, uniquely placed to help the UK trade its way to prosperity. Shipping is an overwhelming success story for the UK and is renowned for its leadership across the world. UK ports are equipped with state-of-the-art modern facilities and equipment, and there are significant further investment plans. Their ambition will ensure that the UK ports are equipped to handle the world's largest vessels now and well into the future. Some of the new ports are absolutely incredible. The speed at which they can lift all these containers off the boats uh, onto rail tracks and disperse it around. That's absolutely incredible. And, and she's not just uh, ports and that, but they're saying all the paraphernalia that goes with it, maritime business services. Ship owners need effective ship brokers, lawyers, bankers, insurers. These business services 
many with a global reach, are a vital part of the maritime sector. And a vast number of service companies are based in London and across the UK. Britain is unmatched for its expertise in shipbroking, insurance and legal and financial services. More vessels are fixed through UK-based shipbrokers, more capital provided by London banks and funds, more vessels insured here than in any other location in the world. English law is also applied to more shipping contracts than the law of any other country, and London has the highest concentration of solicitors, barristers and arbitrators specialising in maritime issues and dispute resolution. This range of activities means the UK can claim to be the world maritime centre. So Britain isn't down in London, she is steaming away. And she has just uh, built the new aircraft carrier using brand new techniques uh, of assembling, uh, using lots of different ports to each assemble a little bit of it, bringing them all together, fixing them together, uh, and they, they find this prefabrication means that they can streamline the building of boats, and Britain now is capable, is learning the skills of how to build ships in a very short period of time. Uh, and this new aircraft carrier will be state-of-the-art, state-of-the-world. Now the government realises Brexit means we've got to do more shipping, we're going to be an exporting, importing country. And so the Red Duster, which is uh, the merchant navy, the government is working to double the size of the UK ship register from 16 to 30 million gross tonnage after we leave and build a new partnership with the EU, propelling the UK from 15th place into the top 10 global maritime nations. This will be good for the UK, helping boost trade and exports, creating jobs and ultimately boosting the economy across the UK. So Britain has been forward thinking. As soon as the Brexit vote was taken, the maritime sector said to the government, look, we've got to talk. We're going to need more ships. We're going to need train more sailors. And they've set in motion all that is necessary. And Britain is this unique mother country. There's no other country fits the bill of having a mother and young lives. Um, this map was in 1898, so by that time America was independent. She became independent in the 1770s. I believe that the uh, uh, United States is one of the young lions. And across the world, there is this network of countries who look to Britain as the mother country. And this is about the United States officially joining the Commonwealth. It's never too late to join. In anticipation of the Commonwealth forming a key role in Brexit trade, the Royal Commonwealth Society has opened an office in the USA in Mississippi, in anticipation that one day the US may join the Commonwealth. Under Donald Trump, with his Scottish ancestry, this may happen soon. The fraternal links between the UK and the USA are strong and well established beyond our language, common legal systems and common interests, the spokesman said. In a similar vein, the US has natural connections based on language, culture, commerce and security with the breadth of Commonwealth countries. The establishment of a branch of the Royal Commonwealth Society in the US will help to strengthen these links to mutual advantage. So that would be interesting if Israel and uh, other countries join the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is a living, dynamic thing. As I say, even countries that were never under British rule are, are wanting to join. And I, I love this quote because this is so apt to the relationship between Britain and her former empire members of the, now in the Commonwealth. Out of the English Civil War came a race of Englishmen who lasted 300 years, who built the British Empire and saw it not crumble like the Roman and Spanish empires had done, but grow into separate nations as children do when they leave the family. And that is so spot on, isn't it? And all associated with Israel. When Britain, the First World War, you know, uh, Americans, Canadians, uh, Australians, New Zealanders, they were all helping 
uh, in that work. And if you want uh, more information, I've been uh, quite brief, um, but Matt Davis has published this little book, The Destiny of Britain, Foretold in the Bible. You can either buy a copy, or if you want a free copy, if you just go to the Christo Open Study Service, uh, find the cover of that book, click on it, you can then download it as a PDF. Well worth looking at. So the remarkable thing is that this Commonwealth has been held together by this remarkable woman. She was uh, anti being in the EU, she would say, so she has to be very careful because she has to be seen to be above politics, but she's no fool is the Queen. So she would say to people, uh, give me three good reasons why we should remain in the EU. And obviously nobody was able to give her three good reasons why we should. And there was quite a stir when the Sun magazine, uh, newspaper, um, had this as their headline, Queen Bats Brexit. But she's a remarkable lady, and uh, I don't know whether you've seen this booklet that came out last year um, in commemoration of uh, 90 years. And uh, the servant queen and the king she serves, she makes it quite clear who the king she serves is, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, a remarkable book, a remarkable queen. Now, Isaiah 23 talked about 70 years according to the days of one king, one ruler. Now, at 65 years she's been ruling Britain. She is our longest monarch ever, and it's not inconceivable that she would continue for another five years to make the 70 years described here. Uh, and interestingly, you know, people say, well, it's about time when you're over 90 to hand over uh, to Charles. But she realises that Charles isn't of the same material. And she is determined. Uh, well, let's just read what it says. Royal sources dismiss growing regency rumours. The Queen has passed some duties to younger royals, but pledged on her 21st birthday to serve the nation for her whole life. The Queen has no intention of stepping aside for Prince Charles and insists it's duty first, nation first, I'm going to be there, according to the sources close to the monarch. Royal insiders say the Queen, the world's longest reigning living monarch, remains as committed as ever to her duty. So her 21st birthday, when she gave that commitment, was 70 years ago, um, last month. <coughs> she married 70 years ago, Prince Philip, in November 1947. And because of her father's ill health, uh, she undertook royal duties in earnest uh, in 1951. So for 67 years, she's been acting as a monarch. So, uh, you know, she's from her 21st birthday when she committed herself uh, to serving uh, God and the country. Uh, that's 70 years. Another three years will be since she undertook royal duties. Another five years um, when it will be 70 years on the throne. And I believe that, you know, as Isaiah says here, Britain is going to give her powers to Israel's new king. And if the Lord gives the queen enough strength, I believe that she will very happily hand over her throne to Israel's king. So, at the end of 70 years, and that's, I believe, we're in this period, what's Britain going to do? She's going to commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. Now, you, you couldn't express anything greater than that than a, a worldwide trading company. And, uh, sorry, as Mrs May said uh, last September, September the year before, uh, Britain's British manufacturing success, British exporting success, and that's the message we'll be taking to the G20, that Britain is open to business, we're open to business around the world, and that's what she's seeking to do. A remarkable lady, uh, her father was a clergyman, uh, and she's a long-standing friend of uh, Israel. In fact, just the night before that uh, she was going to be made Prime Minister, uh, she kept her dinner date with the Chief Rabbi uh, the night before. Boris Johnson, too, is a very pro-Israel person. Uh, 
when he was in Israel in 2015, he said, I can't think of anything more stupid than this uh, divestment, uh, boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. And he's well liked in Israel, and his maternal great-grandfather was a rabbi from Lithuania. Now, I put her up, she had to resign. Uh, she is our ex-Secretary of State for International Development, but she's a Ugandan-born Indian, uh, and again, very close links, and she had to resign because she spent her summer holidays in Israel and had a series of meetings with influential Israeli people as part of her job, but she hadn't told anybody that she was having these meetings and it was against the rules, and in the end, the poor lady was uh, forced out. But I, I don't think we've seen the end of her. I believe that uh, perhaps Mrs May will have to go, uh, and... Uh, who knows, I think she'll play a big role somewhere along the line. So Britain has been working to uh, make uh, links with different nations. Britain is not allowed to sign a trade agreement until she has physically left the EU. That's part of the rules. But it doesn't stop her making uh, approachments and discussing, well, you know, how are we going to draw it up so that when that day comes, then the paperwork can be signed. And this uh, Crawford Falconer was the New Zealand trade negotiator. Well, the problem with Britain was because she'd been in the EU for 43 years. Goodness, that's the time. Um, uh, right, sorry. Uh, had lost all her uh, negotiators because they hadn't been needed. So she's had to bring them in, and uh, he now has moved to Britain, has been working since August time to reorganise things. And the Britain has uh, set up uh, a group uh, in order to be able to negotiate trade agreements. Um, so Britain and Israel, very strong links. Um, well, those are just some of the headlines. Uh, an interesting report, uh, I've just got a black and white copy there. BICOM is uh, British Israel Communications. Uh, a 12, 13, 14 page report of how Britain, post Brexit, uh, and Israel, what they're going to do together. They do a lot already, but Britain is bound by EU rules and regulations which stop her doing a lot. So, you know, the world's the oyster. Britain sees Israel as a most important market. And so Mrs May um, has twice this year gone into the Middle East to strengthen the post-Brexit links with other trading partners. So she's been in Saudi Arabia and Jordan. Let's just look at this. Uh, she sets out her post-Brexit Middle East strategy um, uh, May dismiss suggestions that Britain will be stepping back from the world. She said, we understand that we best defend our values, our interests and our way of life by working together with our international partners to uphold the international rules-based system. May said, under my leadership, we remain profoundly and unequivocally committed to supporting the security of this entire region for example, with our Royal Navy continuing to patrol the Gulf, as it has done for decades. And so she wants to offer the region a security partnership, helping you defend and protect your borders and your people from external aggression. So Britain is saying, we're going back east of Suez. This is where we're coming back to, because it is so vital. As a trading nation, we've got to keep the Suez Canal and that clear, so for trade, we're going to be in this region. We're merchants in that region. And this is from The Economist, which is the headline was truly remarkable. With silver and lead, Britain woos new allies in the Gulf, and it uses the word merchant. So the very language of uh, Ezekiel chapter 27, uh, silver, lead, blah, blah, blah. Now, by silver and lead, it's not saying we're uh, exporting lead to the Middle East. Lead is in the sense of weaponry, with silver, money, and weapons. 
uh, Britain woos new allies. Brexit has been given added impetus to Britain's renewed interest in the region. Just as it ended colonial rule in the Gulf on the eve of its accession in 1973 to the EEC, so now Britain is wooing old partners with a succession of visits. British forces will deploy to Oman after they pull out of Germany in 2019. Merchants offer everything from weapons to sand for gold bunkers has made the Gulf Britain's largest export market after the EU and America. London fund managers play on the jitters over Gulf stability to attract, Gulf, uh, to attract locals' wealth. Such landmarks as the Shard, Olympic Village and Harrods, all Qatari owned, are testimony to their success. Even City Hall, the seat of London's mayor, belongs to Kuwait. And so into this region has come Britain. She has a naval base on Bahrain. She has uh, naval links uh, with the UAE. She's going to move uh, she links with Kuwait there. Uh, she has a base in Jordan. She has bases in Saudi Arabia. She's going to move her troops to Oman. Uh, she has links down in the Gulf there. And so we see brothers and sisters in a wonderful way. Uh, not only we haven't time to look at the uh, young lions, but the young lions equally uh, are playing a role in this region. So in a wonderful way, we see scripture coming to pass before our lives.